Hi, blessings. Um, how are you doing? I hope you're okay. Um, I hope that today wasn't too stressful. Um, I know it's not optimal that we are unable to meet in person, but what I do understand is that in spite of what it is that we do not have, God always has a way. So I pray that today you are encouraged. I pray that you're strengthened. Um, and I, I hope that you're reminded that Christ is indeed sovereign. He oversees all and he knows all. So leave your worries behind. Um, so I have two things I would like to ask of you. First thing is, I pray uh, that you just don't get distracted. It's easy uh, as we're watching, um, you know, these sermons for us to be doing other things. And oftentimes, because we're distracted, we often miss some of the points that are made. And we all are, are called to, to grow with one another in the scriptures. So for your sake, um, you know, try, try to... to Pay attention, not just to this, but to all of the sermons. And then the second part is, um, have your physical Bible with you. Um, and it's not only an aspect of distraction, but I, I find it for me, at least anyways, um, when I have the physical Bible, I can, you know, underline, highlight, I can point out certain things, circle, um, here, see, it, it just it just helps to connect certain things and it helps me to remember uh, a whole lot better um, what it is that I'm reading so I can make the connections. So it's not just reading for the sake of reading, but seeing Christ and how he works in the scriptures. Anyhow, um, I hope family is well. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Listen, the semester is almost over, but by God's grace, by God's grace, we've made it thus far. Um, so if you would bow your head with me just, just for a moment. Heavenly Lord, here we are. Um, full of things on our plate. Could be family, work, and school, papers, now preaching to one another. But I pray that these exercises, O oh Lord, are, are used not only for us to grow, but to encourage one another. So speak to us and through us and strengthen us, O oh Lord, so that we can grow in Christ Jesus. Help us not to speak of ourselves. Help us not to glorify things that are not of you but to glorify Christ of whom you have said, in whom we have life, so that as we are in this world, so is he, because as he is, so are we. Thank you for your transformation power and your provisions um, so that we are able to make it each day. Um, speak, Helen, Lord, we are listening in Jesus' name. We will be praying. Amen. All right, so today we are in Mark chapter 5. Mark 5. Again, it's Mark. Yeah, I know. You can't. <sighs> we'll get used to it. Anyways, that's Mark 5, verse 21, right? So 21 um, till the end, and uh, that will be verse 43. So Mark 5, again, verse 21 to 43. So we'll just go through the story, and we'll see what it is that God has for us. So the story goes something like this, right? So right before we get to... to 21, Jesus in, in chapter 4, right, uh, was, was on a boat. You know, there was a little interaction with the disciples, and, and it, it, it taught us that Jesus has authority over the wind and the sea, right? They, they marveled, they were, they were astonished, even afraid that, that this, this man could, could speak to, to the wind and to the sea, and it would calm down. But then afterwards, he encountered with uh, a man who, who was filled with, with evil spirits, filled with de uh, demons, filled with, um, um, uh, I guess, evil spirits is what we can call them, fallen angels. And yet Jesus commanded that to be, to be eradicated from that. He commanded them to go into the uh, to the pigs, and, and the pigs fell. So it, again, teaches us that Jesus has authority not only over the natural things, but he also has authority over the supernatural. And now, uh, Jesus, getting on the other side, uh, verse 21, he crossed over in the boat to the other side, and a large crowd, you know, surrounded him. And, and what that tells us so far is that as Jesus was popular back then, Jesus is as popular today. Now, <laughs> popularity doesn't always mean that people know you. You can have a thousand friends on Facebook, but you only really know 30 of them. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of people have been proclaiming the name of Jesus, whether they are in sport or, I mean, you know, all type of sports. You know, you, you have in football, people are, you know, 
And yet we know how their lifestyles are to some degree. We're not here to condemn, but the Bible tells us that we'll know about we'll know them by their their fruit, right? So it's important for us to recognize that even today, as Jesus was, so is he now, that he is indeed popular. A lot of people know Jesus, or at least they know of him. A lot of people are willing to, to follow a little bit in the hopes that they can trickle down some blessings in a hope that they are able to receive as the other person received without following too far. Wherever Jesus was, there was a crowd, and they were always willing to follow to some extent. And as Jesus gets on the shore, and as Jesus is, 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 is speaking to these people, uh, it tells us in verse 22 that one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him, fell at his feet. So now, okay, we, we have Jesus, and we, we've been told that he has authority over the natural and the supernatural. And now we have the crowds who are hoping possibly to get something from this person who has authority over the natural, possibly over the supernatural, right? People are coming in to get healed, to get food, whatever he was providing, they wanted it, in a physical sense anyhow. But this man, he was a bit different, because it tells us of his status. He wasn't just a, a lay person. He wasn't just an ordinary person. He was somebody of high, high status. It tells us he was a synagogue official, right? Typically, you, you, that would be your lawyers or your Pharisee, right? So somebody who 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 is high up there, who has authority in, in whatever city that they reside. It tells us his name, you know, it's important because if they're willing to write down his name, that means that he was known enough around his time, right, for people to know, oh, this is, this is who, this is, oh, oh, I can go to him to confirm if this is indeed true. And now it tells us what he does when he encounters Christ Jesus. He falls at the feet of Jesus Christ. Notice again, this man who is high status, this man who has all of this glory, now is bringing himself down to fall at the feet of Jesus. And why is he doing that? He's imploring Jesus, verse 23, right? Earnestly, it tells us. And he says, my little girl at this point is dying. She's about to die. And he, he cries, he says, please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Now, now he believes for a fact that Jesus is able to do that. I, we don't know how he, he knows this, but, but what we do know is that he believed that, that Jesus has the power to heal his little girl. Now, it tells us that his fear is that it's not that the fact that she's sick, but she's sick unto death. Now, I, I don't know if this resonates with you, as a person who is interceding on behalf of someone. Maybe it's, you know, a mother or a child. Or maybe it's for a friend or a spouse. Maybe it is for someone in your congregation, or maybe it is for even your pastor. Maybe it's for a professor or or even your enemy. Like somebody is, is in need and you are interceding on their behalf. You are going to the feet of Jesus Christ. And notice the response of Christ Jesus. Verse 24, Jesus went off with him. He went off with him. And a large crowd was following him and pressing upon him. Now, again, right, wherever Jesus moved, there's always a, a large crowd. But Jesus heard the plea of Jairus and decided he's going to go to heal this little girl. Now, again, we, we know what Jesus is, is capable of doing. He, he was able to command the sea and command the wind to come down, and they did. He was able to command demons, right? Not just one, not, not just two, right? But, but a, 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 a legion of them in a man to, to get from the man, to go somewhere, uh, and, and for this man to be restored. He has the power just by his words to display his authority. And yet, even so, he chose to follow Jairus. But in the midst of going, he encounters someone. Now, keep in mind, right? The crowd is pressing upon him. And when it's a crowd, it doesn't mean, you know, just a just hundred people. Right? We've, we've seen what kind of crowd that Jesus is surrounded by. So 5,000 and up. And as the crowd is pressing upon him, all of a sudden, you know, Jesus says, who touched 
my garment. Verse 30. Now it tells us immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garment? Like, this is crazy, right? What would your response be? If you were part of the crowd, right? If you were walking around Jesus, if you were the one pressing upon Jesus, oh, let's see what he's going to do now. In the hopes that, you know what, after he does what he does, I'm able to, to see another marvelous uh, uh, or maybe get entertained even. Or, or maybe as he's doing the things of which he's doing, maybe I can get some as well. If you are pressing upon Jesus, what would your thought be? I mean, what is what's going on, bro? I, why are you saying this? And it's exactly what the disciple says. And his disciple, verse 31, said to him, you, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who, who touched me? He looked around to see the woman who had done this. Right? So all of a sudden, you know, Jesus feels like, oh, okay. Something just happened. Now, did Jesus not know this was going to happen? Just keep this in mind. Was Jesus blind to what was happening? What was the purpose of this encounter? Now, where was Jesus going? Jesus was going to Jairus' house. For what reason? Because Jairus' daughter was going to die. The sickness is not the problem. It's what the sickness leads to. The reason why Jairus went to Jesus was because... If Jesus does nothing, she dies. And it appears that is his greatest fear. Which is why he's willing to submit himself unto Jesus' feet. But in the midst of that, with such high tension, we are introduced to another character which causes Jesus to stop in his track. And notice the interaction. Now, now again, verse, verse 33 tells us, But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now, circle that whole truth. Because this tells us what happened. And at first glance, you, you can read this and it's, oh, she just said that I touched him and, and, and you know, I've been made well. But, but the emphasis of the verse actually tells us a great deal as to what is happening there. First, it tells us that she was fearing and trembling. Second, it tells us that she knelt down or fell down before him and told him the whole truth. We see in a parallel, like this woman who is given no name, this woman who is out of nowhere touching Jesus, this woman who is now at his feet is like Jairus, but for a different reason. See, Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus because he's interceding on, on, on someone's behalf. But this woman, on the other hand, is at the feet of Jesus because she is afraid after she was, I guess, healed. But it tells us that well, she told Jesus the whole truth. Well, why, why, why is that necessary? What truth did she tell Jesus? Well, the truth that she told Jesus actually goes to verse 25. After Jesus was gone on the way with, with, with Jairus, what happened is, is that there's a woman, verse 25, a woman who had a hemorrhage of for 12 years. So it tells us that this woman is sick, like Jairus' daughter, right? So Jairus is interceding on behalf of his daughter, but this woman who's been sick for 12 years of blood, and who had endured, verse 26, much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, right? So not only did, did she try many things, right? But when she did, she, she, she lost all that she had. The reason why is because it didn't help. Not only did it not help, but it also tells us that it got worse, so after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. Now, look at the parallel, right? Jairus has a daughter who is sick. She's sick to the point of death. Hears of what Jesus is able to do, goes to Jesus and pleads to Jesus on behalf of his daughter. Why? Because his daughter is laying down. There's nothing that she could do. She's dead, essentially. We're about to die. has no hope. And I would imagine that Jairus would have went to physicians. And the physician says, there's nothing that we can do. Jairus says, okay, let's go to another physician. There's no, I mean, he has the means and the money. And he recognized quickly that, that there's nothing that anyone can do except for this man who was able to heal. Except for the, the whom he had heard of. 
And he went and he pleaded to Jesus. Now, this woman, on the other hand, heard of Jesus after many years of suffering at the hands of men, right? Saw that the only option that she she had was this man who was able to, to heal. So both of them are coming to Jesus and both of them found themselves at the feet of Jesus. Now, what was the reason why she was she was trembling is because she had 12 years of hemorrhage, 12 years of, of blood loss, 12 years of her being on her period. Now, the Bible actually tells us what happens to a person or what a person uh, um, that, that is 12 years or that, that has many years of, of um, blood loss should, should be considered as. So if you go to Leviticus chapter 15, this is again Leviticus chapter 15, uh, verse 25, this is what it tells us. Now, if a woman, this is Leviticus 15, 25. Now, if a woman has a discharge of blood, of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity, she is considered to be unclean. Now, notice what it says, verse 26, any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her like her bed at menstruation. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, like her uncleanness at that time. Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Oh, so this woman has been unclean for 12 years. This woman has been essentially ostracized for about 12 years because what would happen is if you are unclean, you cannot be in the midst of the congregation. You're typically set apart. So for 12 years, this woman has been suffering. But the bigger issue is it tells us that the crowd was pressing upon Jesus. That means that people were touching one another. And what does that mean for this woman to be able to walk up to Christ and, and to be able to touch him? That means that she had to touch a whole lot of people. And worse yet, she also touched Jesus. So that means that every person that she came into contact with was now unclean, including Christ. And if that's the case, she has caused a whole lot of issues for them. So what, what does that tell us? If she's caught in this moment, the only alternative is for her to be stoned. So she knelt down at the feet of Jesus and she told him the entire truth. In the hopes that maybe, just maybe, she wouldn't die at the hand of the crowd or at the hand of Jesus. Although she was just made well. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, I don't know if you're like Jairus interceding on behalf of someone. Or maybe you're, you're like this woman who is the one that needs to be interceded on on their, their behalf. You, you are the one who is in disparity. You are the one who is in this turmoil. You are the one who is in need at this moment. So whether you're like Jairus or you're like this woman, notice what Jesus does for both of them. Jesus hears the plea of, of Jairus and he hears the plea of this woman. And as Jairus was interceding on behalf of his daughter, Jesus now interceded on behalf of this woman and calls this woman daughter. Why? What does that have to do for us today? What does that mean for us today? The reality is our job as followers of Christ Jesus is to intercede on behalf of people. So what does that mean? If we're interceding on behalf of people, they are now our brother. Our sister, our father, our mother, they are our children. So as a consequence, when we go to Christ Jesus, we're not going to Christ as if we are speaking for a stranger, but we're going as if they are ours and they're on the verge of death. And on the other hand, if we are the one who is in need, Jesus looks at us as his own. And funny enough, when we look at it, it tells us that in the midst of this, that Jairus is daughter died. But Jesus looks at Jairus and says, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And, and as Jesus tells him that, he, he was able to witness 
what had happened. But keep in mind, the reason why the daughter died was because this woman took the entire time telling her story to Jesus. So if you were Jairus, what would you do? Would you not want to kill this woman? So what does that tell us? Oftentimes we find ourselves, right, pleading uh, on our behalf or asking, Lord, please do something for me. And we see that Christ is working in other people. But but we who, who are supposed to, to receive the blessing, we who are supposed to be delivered, uh, apparently is overlooked. And, and we cry, do not pass me by. But the reality is, do you think that Jesus sleeps? Do you think he slumbers? This is what it tells us in the Psalms. The one who watches over Israel, neither sleep nor slumber. The one who watches over you, brethren, neither sleep nor slumber. So as a consequence, even when it looks like the situation is hopeless, even when it looks like what it is that you are yearning for, the person whom you were interceding on his behalf or on her behalf is not receiving what it is that you are needing. Guess what? Jesus is still in control. Remember, he has authority over the natural and the supernatural. He has authority over life and death. And what happens when he enters into the house? He goes and he tells the little girl, get up. And she gets up. Now, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. This is, this is what it says. It says in verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So brethren, why aren't you calling upon the name of the Lord? It's important, it's imperative for you to do so. And why? Because whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will not be disappointed. So have you been disappointed? Do you feel like it is hopeless? Have you been sitting there hoping that maybe a conference call you or, or you don't know what you're going to do next and it feels like the Lord is not answering the prayer, but guess what? If you call upon his name, he is sure to answer. It may take longer than you hope, but he is on the throne. He is on the throne. Do you believe? Because if you do, I assure you, you will not be disappointed. May the Lord bless you. Amen.